the company Starbucks sees completely different cultures of a team of eight baristas in Miami Hialeah, where they're all Latin employees and Latin customers. You come in, you're likely to spend seven to 12 minutes talking with the cashier register. They will come out from behind the register, grab your child, throw them in the air, squeeze their cheeks, and everyone in this line is now talking with each other, and it's a top-performing store in Hialeah. You take those same eight baristas and put them in Battery Park Starbucks in New York City, and you have them doing the same things with customers there, they probably would get sued, they'd close the store, and they'd be miserable because you're discounting the most important factor, which is culture fit. Welcome to the Work for Humans podcast. This is Dart Lindsley. Juan Luis Betancourt is a seasoned business executive and management expert with over 25 years of experience, and he's led organizations in eight countries over two decades. Juan learned through that work the vital role of meaningful connections. He quickly recognized that a lack of authentic connections negatively impacts productivity and retention at organizations everywhere in the world. Juan is now the CEO of an organization called Human Intelligence. It's a company that uses analytics and AI to optimize, but more importantly, to humanize work across sectors and countries. At Human Intelligence, he's helped clients like Visa and Coca-Cola and Honda to enhance productivity, boost motivation, and reduce turnover in the workplace. In this episode, Juan and I discuss how to humanize work, and particularly how to humanize it using technology, adapting leadership to diverse learning styles, what work culture even is, and how it should evolve with company growth, and other topics. Okay, to support Work for Humans, be sure to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. Without further ado, my conversation with Juan Betancourt. Juan Betancourt, welcome to Work for Humans. Thanks for having me today, Dart. I think there's a really important thing that you're doing that I want to explore. And the thing I want to explore is that you are in the business of equipping companies to be more human. And there's a lot of important things in there. There's what you mean when you say be more human. And then there's the techniques of equipping more humanness. And the thing about equipping more humanness is that it tends to get very sort of mechanical and specific and, and tooly. But on the other hand, humanness is so big. So I want to explore that. And let me start by re reading your mission, if I may. To unleash humanity in the workplace, leveraging technology to make work more human. And to democratize self-awareness and infuse emotional intelligence at work, making it more fun and getting people more engaged where they spend 70% of their waking hours. I want to start by asking, what is more human work for you? It's where people are collaborating and connecting with a higher vibration of resonance where they don't feel like they themselves are a tool, but where the people they're working with understand them, where it's less directive and people telling everybody what everybody has to do and more, more collaboration. I think where the, the chains of command are more on a common vision versus hierarchy and where people lead from the heart, not just from the head. Do you have examples of that happening really well in your work history? Yeah. So when one does training, one can identify the right content. A person's a certain level, they're in finance, they need to get this training for that role. That's not very human. That's a skill. What makes it human is that individual likes to work to learn in self-study and doesn't like learning in a group. So instead of the company giving all 50 finance executives or managers training in the same way, making work more human means how you train depends on how that person likes to learn. And if half the group like to learn in self-study, you create training programs that allows them to do it on their own time in self-study. If half the group likes to learn in a group, give it to them that way. If some of the group likes to learn with pure data and analysis, create training for that group the way they like to learn versus others who are more conceptual, maybe do more whiteboard type training. So one example is through training and making that more personal or personalized on how someone likes to learn. A second example is leadership. At Procter & Gamble, which is recognized as one of the leading management companies in the world, they actually have more CEOs in the Fortune 500 
than any other combination of companies out there. So they clearly, and across all industries. When I was promoted at the age of 26, after four years of being an assistant brand manager, I became a brand manager. And here I was, a pretty cocky young guy. Procter & Gamble was a feeder to Harvard Business School in Wharton. And so they select from the top schools. Um, and it was a management training program. And here I was, I got promoted. And I thought, now my life will be easier. Now five people report to me and they'll have to do what I say. And my boss who promoted me said, now Juan, actually the challenging part comes to be a great leader at Procter & Gamble and anywhere, you actually have to learn about each person and how each person likes to be led, how each person likes to be communicated to, and it will be different for five different people. So now Juan, you as boss have to become more agile and you actually have to change the way you lead for all five subordinates. And I thought, what? That, that sounds impossible. I have to actually learn. And that's what it's like to be a leader that's more human. So those are two examples, both training and leadership, where it's clear that there's a more human way of doing it. So what is it that human intelligence does? What are the services that it provides? And then I want to build back from there to how you got there. The first step to collaborating with someone, the first step to engaging, to connecting, to making someone feel complete and like you respect them and then there's trust is understanding them. If you walk into a meeting and just get to work, it's probably going to offend people. In some cultures outside the U.S., you actually have to spend 10, 15 minutes breaking the ice. In Brazil, you always start with a joke in, in the meetings. In certain countries, you literally will spend 20 minutes just talking about personal things, right? And so there's different degrees of making work personal and understanding the person across the table, whether it's a client or your own team members, you're onboarding someone. And so understanding is the key. I would call it the portal to walk through to even be able to have human connection. And so human intelligence is a 10 minute personality test, a, a technically validated psychometric instrument that's been validated over 30 years. It measures three things. We call it the BMW framework. It measures behaviors, which is like 80% of the tools out there. We measure motivators or what some tools call values. That's like another 20% of the tools out there. And then very few tools measure work style. So B, behaviors, M, motivators, W, work styles. How does the environment give you energy or take energy away from you? What we've done, though, is disintermediated an entire $3 billion industry because everyone knows that assessments, personality tests are great at the moment in that workshop where you're spending like $20,000 for your executive team. But they're not given to all employees because they're too cost prohibitive to do so. And then even those executive teams that take it, they go back to work three weeks later. They don't remember anything. They don't know where they filed it. They don't use it. And by the way, if the company's 10,000 employees, your workshop was with five people, you're not actually even needing it for the other 5,000 people you work with. And so what we did is what Grammarly did. Grammarly has disintermediated 800 years of vocabulary, thesaurus, and grammar, not by creating one new thing but solely delivering it with technology, the tips on how to write better into your Word documents, into other documents. We've done the same industry disintermediation with assessments. You give a tool, a link, 10-minute test to 10,000 employees on Monday morning, ask them to take the tool, not just for developing themselves and understanding themselves, but for understanding others. And then all of the insights are surfaced, like Grammarly, in email, in calendar, in virtual meetings like Zoom, Cisco WebEx, or Teams, and even in Slack and, and Microsoft Teams general platform. And so at any moment, you can write an email, push a button, and AI rewrites the email the way that Dart likes to communicate and receive information. You're in a calendar meeting that's an important presentation. It'll tell you insights around the person you're trying to influence, or that the entire meeting, everyone's extremely deliberate and you're decisive. So how to manage that meeting better so you don't upset people the way your style is versus the majority, how to do training better based on people's learning styles in a training, or if someone's not following, understanding right there in that meeting, in the column, why they're not learning. So that's what we've done. We've kind of brought the human element of understanding at scale through technology, ironically, and through AI to enhance people and enhance the connection between people, just like in marriage, right? In marriage, it takes time to understand how to come to the middle. But then it's beautiful what can happen when you are able to understand the other person and come to the middle. We deliver that at scale for all employees. I'm always kind of circling things like psychometric tests with a, a fair amount of wariness. And some of the, my wariness is, I think, very normal, which is that you worry about validity. And you've talked a little bit about the, the validity of this test and the test of, of this. But there's kind of a deeper question, which is, I worry that 
tests that put people into a category are actually going to make us know less about who they are. And there's a couple of ways that that can happen. One is, oh, you're just a Myers-Briggs type or whatever it is. You're just that type. And so I put you into that type and I do two things. One is I've sort of, I, because I have a box for you, I've ignored all your complexity. And then the second issue is there is that I assume you're fixed. Like you are a, that you're not a changing thing. That you are not only that category, but you're going to be that category forever. And in fact, tests where people change over time sometimes are considered less valid because they're supposed to be permanent. And so the way you speak about it, it's a humanizing activity. And my concern is that it might not be, that it might have a different effect. Yeah, let me address that. That comes up with our largest clients, right? We, we sell our product to companies like Accenture, Coca-Cola, BASF, Baptist Health, United Healthcare, EY, Wells Fargo, all either doing pilots or have bought the product. And that comes up. And so a couple things to address that. Humans are complex and there is nuance. Unfortunately, many of the tools out there, like the ones you mentioned, I won't mention them, only put you into four buckets. You are X or Y, and then there's four letters. And so literally you are one of eight things or four of eight things. Ours has a scale that goes left to right. That's zero to 30 times 28. So there's actually 8,860 some combinations of profiles. Our tool can show that somebody can be decisive in half the situations and deliberate in the other half. And so it's a tool that actually accounts for that nuance. And we've been able to capture the complexity, but deliver the output in a way that it's not confusing, that doesn't pigeonhole people just on the visualization of the results or the qualitative. And so someone could have of the 28 attributes, seven or eight, where they're right in the middle, where it shows that they can be both. So imagine a sports athlete, they are both ambidextrous, they're right and left-handed. And so people see them dribbling with their right hand in basketball and say, oh, they must not be left-handed. All of a sudden they're dribbling with their left hand. Oh wait, they can do both. So that's one thing is just the way the tool was constructed was to avoid that projection on others. Second, it's not fixed. We believe at human intelligence that everyone changes. And so people's behaviors change. People's work styles change. And what was shocking for me running this, because I'm not an IO psychologist, we have a whole team of IO psychologists. They were trying to convince me that someone's motivations, the middle letter, BM, the motivations, values change. And I thought, no, my values haven't changed after 40. Well, how can values change? But it's amazing if you're a molecule and you're vibrating in terms of what motivates you and your value system, and you're put on a team with five other people and they have completely opposite motivations, values, you will actually start to vibrate like them and be part of that vi same vibration or it'll be organ rejection and you will leave and you'll be miserable. Some people can actually, because it's important to them, they need that job or they just are open to a new way of being, change. And so we have people take the personality test every year. It doesn't cost the companies or the individual any money. And because people do change and the team you're with changes or a big life event changes you. So we do believe that people can change and that the test will pick up on that. And you can actually take pictures of your profile and of your team's profile, the dynamics or what we call team culture every year to see how that's changing and actually guide it to an endpoint. And there was one last point, a third point around this is that you can self-score. So if the tool comes up with a result that you don't agree with in our platform, you can say, hey, the tool is 80% right and the behavior is 80% right or 90% right in the motivators. But you know my work styles, I've actually learned to be really uh, data-driven because I've worked at, in a, as an analyst in JP Morgan all these years. So I'm actually, although my tendency is to be conceptual, I actually am now data-driven. And so you can actually show that and turn that on for others to see. And you can even ask your team that you work with every day, every week, those five to eight people, for them to grade you. Because sometimes you might have a misperception of yourself. And if there are 10 people telling you, hey, Juan, you think you're decisive, but we all experience you that you're all very deliberate. That's really great feedback to know if somehow you're misperceiving yourself. Those make a lot of sense to me. I also, there's this other use case that I think you equip, which is you're meeting somebody the first, for the first time. You're never going to meet them again, potentially. You need a shorthand to understand them right then. You don't have time to learn all that complexity. With your own team, you can. With your own team, you can learn all that complexity, but just getting a little bit down the road and recognizing that somebody is different from you is, even if it weren't perfectly accurate, knowing that there can be differences, I think is, is a humanizing event. Correct. And you're actually hitting on a fourth point that I would bring up as well. Although this might put people into categories and personas, the reality is it's already happening, but without data. 
everyone is projecting on others what their perceptions of others are. So today, actually, when you're working with someone, you walk in a room, one will actually project that, oh, that person looks this way, therefore they're this way. And they're already adapting themselves to what they think someone is. This tool starts to get rid of that projection and that subjectivity so that you go in much more open. And so this actually allows people to hold space and avoid projection and actually use data to understand someone. My whole life, and maybe why I created human intelligence, people misunderstood me. And it was the most frustrating thing. Because of my cultural background being Latin, I communicate in storytelling. I give data point, data point, data point, data point, and then the conclusion at the end. And I use my hands, and I'm all over the place. And in an Anglo culture, British background, US, that was not the way you communicated. You say the statement or the conclusion, and if they want more information, you give it to them. You don't give the story. And so people thought, they concluded, oh, this guy's all over the place. I can't follow him. He's not structured. Within three months of any job or any team I've ever worked with, people were coming to me and saying, Juan, I totally misunderstood you. Because of your style, I was projecting that you weren't structured. It turns out I've never met a human being in my life that's more structured and more data-oriented than you, but I was misunderstanding that, and that was what led to the friction at the beginning of our relationship. A tool like this would have helped avoid three months of friction and gotten us onto the right framework of working together. I actually experienced this a little bit today, which is would have been way better if I experienced it a week ago because I, I read your profile. And one of the things is tries to have homework done and appreciates the same from others. Like when someone supports a position with facts and data, that's one of yours. And so I was like, I should have sent those, my notes on prep to you before this morning. <laughs> <laughs> and if I'd read this ahead of time, I would have done that. I would have sent you those notes ahead of time because I would have said, this is somebody who might like to think about things ahead of time more than I do, for instance. And by the way, the first thing I did this morning waking up was look for it. And that's why I found it. And that's why I did get to review it prior, because that's important to me. <laughs> Understanding the way one likes to work and what energizes them and gives them energy. I mean, that's a really powerful concept. Today, everyone's just doing their thing their own way with in complete disregard for others. The workplace is very selfish. I do not think that's human. I think being human is connecting and knowing and understanding that we are all one. And to understand someone breeds trust. Yeah, even to try. Yes, people appreciate it. You know, how many times when you're in a foreign country, the fact that someone tries to speak the language, even if you're butchering it, breeds more trust than the person who just comes out and speaks their native language and assumes you're going to speak it. So how did you arrive at creating this product? How did you arrive there? What was your path that led you to a place where you said, I think this is the intervention? We don't have five hours because it is a life body of work that has led me here, at least 50% of it completely out of my control. So this wasn't a grand vision that I said, I need to create this product for this problem and let me go do it. My entire life, I was misunderstood from having a Hispanic name like Juan, but sounding like an American where people would tell me all the time, you don't look Hispanic, you don't talk like a Hispanic, you don't look Latin, to relationships where people often want to be with their own kind. And after spending hours at a bar or in a room with someone at a party, that individual, when I exchange information at the end, are shocked and horrified that I have a different name. And so I actually always wanted to connect and feel part of something. In my high school, I was the only Hispanic, really. I mean, there might have been five of us and 2,000 students. So I've always tried to connect. And when you're young and adolescent, it hurts when people don't accept you for who you are, but label you based on a name or a look. And so at 22, I left the US to go find connection. And I learned languages to go find connection. I speak five languages like English fluently. And I've worked as an executive in France, in Germany, in Dubai, in China, in Brazil, in Puerto Rico, 20 years working as an executive outside the US figuring out how to be agile to connect. And it's very few people that can say they've worked in all these countries at high levels, managing tens of thousands of people in foreign languages. But I figured out how to connect. So that was like the genesis is that I, my whole life was built around how do I connect? How do I lead with connection? Because all these countries and cities, I was thinking, I will have to build my home here. I will have to have a family here. So you're trying to connect at the deepest level not in a cultural appropriation way, but in a, I want to be part of this society and become part of this group. At the end, though, I did come back to the U.S. because when I looked around at all the executives around me, there were no foreign people in France leading companies. There were no 
foreigners leading companies in Brazil, and there were no foreigners leading companies in Dubai, and there were no foreigners leading companies in China. And I realized very quickly why the USA is the greatest country in the world for people who want to lead companies and create ideas into reality. And it's that in the US, whether socially you get accepted or not doesn't matter. If you have a great idea, you can build a company and you will be rewarded. And so will the employees that company. So I came back at the age of 40. I had worked in management for 20 years. I then went into headhunting. So basically executive search, finding executives. And that's where my ability to connect others, like matchmaking, an executive with a role, a challenge, a cultural fit with a team and an industry, I became the best, one of the best in the country. Being a partner at Hydrogen Struggles four years, a partner at Corn Ferry for four years, even running my own search firm. And I was very good at it. And I could figure that out. Even socially, I had connected 80 couples for marriage. I'm very good at understanding what works. So between my own personal experience and connecting others professionally and socially, I thought, wow, how do I scale my headhunting ability? How do I scale this, this skill that I'm getting paid a lot of money for, not just for executives, but for the masses? And I found a tool, this psychometric tool by uh, a professor and, and doctor of psychology and, and IO psychologist. And in 10 minutes, he had figured out, it used to be a three-hour tool, but in 10 minutes, over 30 years, he got it down to measuring behaviors, motivators, work styles, what nobody could measure in an hour. So I knew I had found the right tool. And now I needed to build a software company around it. And that's where human intelligence was launched in around 2015, 16, as a recruiting tool to do hiring, what I did for executives, at scale. And so we built this company, got it to several million in revenue, had major clients like Ashley Furniture was reducing turnover by 30 and 40% in retailers manufacturing, and it worked. But then COVID came and COVID obliterated our company because who in the right mind would be paying a monthly recurring revenue for recruiting when they were firing other employees and not using our tool. So we lost all of our revenue. I had to fire 14 of 18 employees by summer of 2020. So first phase was the genesis of me as a human being trying to connect. Second phase was career connecting people and headhunting. Third phase was launching this recruiting tool, but getting to human intelligence, smarter AI collaboration was the fourth phase. That was when we lost all revenue. I was lost all my investment and my friends who had invested in me, which was a horrible feeling. Had to fire people who were really hardworking, great people. That fourth phase was going to our recruiting clients and saying, what can we use this great assessment tool today for, for your current challenges in this context of, of COVID and working remote? And they all said, Juan, in your recruiting tool, you have a onboarding feature where the new employee and the boss can see really cool side-by-side -side images and tips on how to onboard better and how that one individual will impact the culture, the team dynamics of the team and who they're going to be cause friction with and where the biggest risks are for onboarding that person. Those insights, Juan, we love them for onboarding, but we need that for all of our teams. And for the bigger companies, they said, we need that for all of the cross-functional work. So any company with more than 500 employees, you're constantly working with new people. And 10,000 employees, you're on cross-functional teams every three months with new people. And so there was born human intelligence in its current iteration of smarter collaboration. That was about two years ago. And then it became smarter AI collaboration with ChatGPT about six months ago, where we use ChatGPT to serve up the insights so people don't have to actually stop and interpret and think, because that's something that young people don't like doing too much. They just like the answer being given to them. And so we've kind of created a combination of giving the answer, but explaining why as well. So we can train Gen Zers, millennials on soft skills, on why you have to understand someone and how they're different, not just tell them the answer of, hey, we're rewriting the email for you. We actually say, we're rewriting it for you. And here's why you should understand that about Dart. And some of your, your case studies are about helping organizations with culture. And I never really know what culture is. I ask this of a, lot, of a lot of different people, which is, I don't know what it's made of. And so I don't know how to work on it. And I notice that when I'm inside a culture, I can't see it. It's only when I move from one culture to the next that I'm all of a sudden, oh, this is different because I, you can only see the differences. We get so acclimatized to our cultures. How is connectedness like this, this understanding of differences between people, how does that relate to the work you do on culture? Yeah. So we actually start with collaboration, then move to talent analytics, where you're seeing populations of people's data and understanding the culture of an individual, a team, a division, and an entire company to a CEO culture dashboard. 
all the way through to using those insights for recruiting. So we have these three modules. That entire platform, we actually call the culture management platform. And every company in the world will use a culture management platform one day, ours or others. And so culture is not a temperament study. A lot of people have spent a lot of money thinking that if I understand if my people are happy or sad and about to quit or not, that that's my culture. No, because Microsoft and Apple actually use the same temperament study. I don't know if it's Qualtrics, Perceptics, but I know they use the same one. And they both end up with 10% of their employees, super engaged, love the company, would give a, a child for it. There's 30% that it's a job. They're not super engaged. They're not not engaged. And then there's 60% that are not engaged, right? They're not engaged. They're not happy with their job. They thought they'd get free products or whatever, but they have the same results. If you ever go to Apple and Microsoft, there couldn't be any two cultures more different. And so these temperament studies don't get to the psychology of the organization. And so what is culture? I truly believe that culture is the roll-up of the psychology of every employee. And so if you have a team of five people, what is the culture of those five people working together? Well, if they're all really decisive and they're all self-starters and they only care about making money, you're going to have some cutthroat practices and you're going to have some bad actors, right? Every time I hear a company talk about their culture, it comes down to the aggregate of the individuals in that company. And any company with data, and our clients have the data, learn very quickly that there is not one culture in a company. If you actually have one culture, you will fail miserably. And what do I mean by that? If the finance and accounting people at Coca-Cola, all hundred of them, who were probably very picture finance and accounting people, they're structured, they're process oriented, they're not probably creative and innovative, have the same way of working, the same motivators, behaviors, and work styles as the marketing team. Well, the marketing team is probably going to have horrible ad campaigns. And if the salespeople who don't take risk and just sit there and do things in a linear fashion, like the finance, so you actually have very different cultures by function. Coca-Cola Argentina, which sits right next to Coca-Cola Brazil, have extremely different cultures of how to work. There's a reason why Walmart failed in Korea, failed in India, failed in Mexico, failed in Argentina, and actually failed in every country they went with their culture, ended up buying local retailers and changing the name to Walmart, but keeping the local culture. They put in all the same systems, but a culture is not the software you put in. A culture will transcend always to be your people. And so we are the first company to actually measure that at scale to understand the culture of an individual, to culture of a team of 5, 10, 20 people, of a division, of a function, of a country. And here's a perfect example. There was a, a large restaurant chain, not even a chain, a 100 employee, like almost like a cheesecake factory that has like, it's like 50 tables in a town in Minnesota, not a huge town. And there were several other competing restaurants. The owner and manager of the restaurant would do engagement surveys. And 95% of the employees were super engaged, loved their job, but sales were going down, they were losing customers. A lot of companies invest in these engagement surveys and just make sure all employees are always happy. This guy was paying like $23 an hour. So he was the highest paying restaurant chain or restaurant in all of this town. So he got lots of people working for him. Everyone was really happy, but guess what? We went to him and said, look, you have high turnover and you have horrible service. Your Yelp scores are one or twos. You're going to go out of business. Why don't you actually measure the real culture of your company? He goes, yeah, but I do an engagement. Survey. No, no, no. That has nothing to do with it. Do you have service-oriented people who are problem solvers, who are belonging, create a team spirit in your restaurant? He goes, I don't know. I, I pay them well. They should do that. No, no, no. You can't pay people to be a certain way. It comes with who they are. So we did the, the culture analysis of all the 100 people. And sure enough, he only had people focused on making money who were self-starters, who were not problem solvers, and who basically really didn't care about the clients. They were not service-oriented and they're what motivates them. And so he started to use our tool for hiring and only hired an ideal profile, which were people who were self-starting problem solvers, who were service-oriented, felt belonging, and didn't care about money. He reduced salaries to about $20 or 18, something crazy. So had to spend, spend less money. And sure enough, within three months, turnover went down. Yelp scores went to five stars and he put all the other restaurants out of business. And I was at a conference like a year later talking about this case study of 500 HR executives. And someone said, raise their hand instead of a question. They said, I want everybody in this, this room of 500 people to know I live in that town. It was, it was crazy. I, no, I did not plant this person. And that restaurant was seen as the worst service, the most attitude servers. And we didn't know what happened, but within six months, it became the top restaurant in the town and they're flourishing. And she goes, now I know why they were actually measuring culture and changing the culture based on data, not based on hiring who they liked or paying more money.
Framed that way, culture is a hiring problem. In other words, it's a who's there problem, especially because although there is some flexibility in people and people may join the team and change their behaviors to some extent, may change what motivates them if they can. But there's this sort of base personality composition of your company that makes its culture. And I'll tell you where this is super intriguing to me because I've been trying to understand this one particular thing. Let me see if I can find it. There's analytic versus holistic thinking. I just ran across a good definition of the difference between these two. Analytic is we look for objects, assign properties to them, and then try to explain the behavior of the system based upon the property assigned to those objects. And so that's exactly what you were just talking about, which is that the, it's the attributes of this sort of the atoms of the company, which is the people, and that those attributes are psychological. And then the holistic version is we look at the relationships and interconnections between things. And they're not mutually exclusive, right? Because the nature of the atoms may drive the nature of the interconnections. But you can start either place. Correct. And that's where the magic happens. There is a professor who was at Harvard for many years in the business school, and now at MIT, his name is Professor Don Soul, S-U-L-L, runs a company called Culture Index with his son. Anyone listening to this podcast, go re read his research. He came out last summer. He looked at the Fortune 500, did surveys with thousands of employees in all these companies, and he compared the cultural four or five values on the websites that top-down executives say, this is who we are. This is what we stand for. And then he interviewed the employees to see if there was any correlation between what the four or five values are of the Fortune 500 and actually employees what they believe the culture of the company is. He found no correlation and actually a negative correlation in usually three of the five. And ironically, of the 500 Fortune 500, 80% have four of the same five values. Basically, they all want to be customer oriented, agile, and they're coming up with these things that are just top down that have nothing to do with reality. And when people go to companies, they're joining these kind of preset culture, top-down organizations that they actually have no idea what the real culture is. Yeah. Admittedly, a lot of those sort of statements of value are what the company wishes it was. Correct. Not necessarily a statement of what they think, even what the leadership thinks they are. It's more of a directional thing. But it's also why when you join a company, you can't look at those things and say, well, that sounds like a good company. In fact, it's probably negatively correlated with what the value statement is. Yes. <laughs> for exactly the reason that they wish they were more that way. Correct. <laughs> so one of the things about equipping companies to have a more human kind of work, the objective there is to create an experience for the people who work there. But the way to sell it into the company is often around productivity. And can those really go together? Can you sell a product with a productivity pitch that results in more human work? Very insightful question because it took me three years to realize that the buyer that I'm pitching to, the ICP, who's a very senior executive, is not actually going to be the user of our product. So the message we sell to the executive buyer and the experience they have should be focused on productivity, ROI, and why will their company perform better? But the people that we pilot with and train were, it's a much more emotional pitch, if you will, to human connection and work being more human because now you can understand each other. And so there is this duality when we go to market, which does make it harder to sell the product. It's interesting because if the product lives on its own, like if it's something that, that it can be effective independent from the people you sold it to, if it's a really independent thing, then it can have the effect to the individuals in the organization and an effect that the people most concerned about productivity. They have to move a little bit independently, otherwise the one could, could screw up the other. Correct. And it is a, a nuanced, balanced sales process. The easiest thing to sell it is once we do the trial in a certain group within the company, nobody buys it for the whole enterprise day one. They buy it for United Healthcare, for example. They're trying it for 3,000 people. The next phase, if that goes well for three months, they'll, they'll use it for 10,000 people and then potentially half a million employees. But those 3,000 people, we will see about 75% adoption and usage over six months, where 75% of employees are using it, on average about 20 times a month, where they're actually clicking to get the insights. And so we also do surveys internally in, in the tool where every month, or we, we, I think for the pilots every week, does this tool, has this tool helped you work better with your manager or better with your subordinate? 
Is your team working better now with this tool than before? And so we get usually 90% qualitative reporting. So both from usage and qualitative surveying, clearly everyone in the company thinks it makes sense and uses it um, or getting insights and, and improving productivity. Today, people are too busy. If there's a tool that's not adding value, you won't get usage more than 5%. You couldn't even pay them to use it, basically. Yeah, I noticed, by the way, that I use LinkedIn in very much the way I gather information out of LinkedIn that's similar, not as structured, much more informal to the kind of information that you're getting, which is it's time to relationship information. That's what I call it, which is, you know, you go in and you get an understanding. And that's why it's great to put hobbies and stuff like that into your LinkedIn, because time to, to relationship is sped up that way. What you just said is, is bullseye. We do what LinkedIn, so there's three things to, that can quickly accelerate understanding someone. Content, like where did they work? What's their job title? What level are they, right? I would call that content. Context, how long have they been doing these things? What are their hobbies and, and things that you know they do personally? So context, so the what, the who, and where the how. How should you deliver the message? Now that you know these other things, the how they like to work, not just what they do, but how. And so I think it's a three-legged stool. And at a large company, you probably go and look at LinkedIn for about 15 to 20 times a month. You're not doing it for every meeting. You're not doing it for your own team. Maybe the first time you onboard with them, you will do it. Our tool is exactly like LinkedIn, used the exact same number of times for anyone new to understand how to relate to them, how to understand them, how to work with them, how to deliver the message. And by the way, in an engagement survey is the what's happening. Oh, we have 30% turnover. Oh, we have this manager and their team doesn't like them. That's the what. The why it's happening is always explained by the behaviors, the motivators, and the work styles, and the clash within an organization. The why is the cultural piece that we measure and explain why the engagement survey turns out the results it does, or why the sales results are the way they are. You have a, a list of myths related to culture in one of your case studies, and you've already named a lot of them. But there's a couple that I want to call out that we, that we haven't already spoken about. Companies fail because they can't maintain culture when they grow. This is a great one. Yeah, what's the basis of that myth? You often have a CEO and an original management team of three or four key executives. They launch a company, they get to a million, they now are like 10 or 12 people. They go to 5 million, they're now hiring 20, 30, and now they're going to 10 million, they're like at 50 to 100 employees. And they are mistaken and they're in the room interviewing, right? It's like that famous, the CEO and meets everyone. They want to make sure they keep the same culture. And culture is so important. We got to where we got because of the culture we have. Now, what's interesting is the behaviors and what motivates people and the work styles of a company going from zero to one million, you need a very innovative culture that is completely breaking and pivoting every six months or, or more often and not worrying about having rigid process procedure and everything data-driven you need to get 70% and execute on it and just try to, it's about speed. Can I just say, are you speaking from experience of the last four years? I mean, that's part of it, right? The story you told of your last four years is like, sounds like a football player run, running down the field and like dodging defenders. That is the startup life. And to succeed, you need to be, it's a completely different behavioral mindset, motivational mindset and work style mindset. And you want most employees in the company to be that way. Even the finance person, you want to be that way because they need to change the SaaS model and what the drivers are every couple of months. That would drive a, an accountant at a big five firm crazy, right? So that's zero to a million, maybe zero to three million. And unfortunately, CEOs drink their own Kool-Aid and don't realize that there comes a moment where putting in process, putting in structure, hiring people a little bit more deliberate who care about being stable in process that's structured and define actually leads to being able to scale because as a nimble startup, you want to adapt for every customer. But the minute you get the bigger customers, you can't adapt to all of them. And you need to put in things that are scalable, that are process oriented, and you have one contract and not everybody's throwing out their own contract. And you want to be able to train one salesperson and then put it into a library of training or interactive training where you don't need people. And so there is an inflection point between 3 million and 5 million that you'll never get to 10 million if you keep hiring the same people in the same type of culture. And when you get to 10 million, you have to change the culture again and the types of people. When you get to 100 million, and so I saw that most clearly when I worked for, although a man who is misunderstood because he's quite intense, a guy named Tom Siebel. I worked directly for Tom Siebel at Siebel Systems. I was like employee 200. 
They were about eight million in revenue. And I saw this man take the company from eight million to a hundred million to a billion to three billion in two years. And he changed out his entire management team at every inflection point. He told the C I heard that he had changed the CFO when they hit a million to a CFO who took a company to 10 million because those were different cultural attributes, all finance people. And at 10 million, he changed the CFO to get them to a hundred million. At a hundred million, he changed the CFO to get to a billion. At a billion, he changed the CFO again. And he did that for every leader role in the company because he knew that the culture had to change at every phase of the company. Most startups fail and they think they fail because they couldn't keep the culture quite contrary. CEOs of startups fail because they're trying to force the same culture through the different phases of growth, and that will lead to failure. That is absolutely fascinating. And, I, and it also occurs to me, the unvarying infrastructure of variation. That's what it was called, the unvarying infrastructure of variation. It was in organisms. There's just, abs this is like super academic, and I apologize to my listeners. <laughs> In organisms, there's so much that tries to make it stay the same. There's all of these mechanisms that are all about keeping the DNA the same, everything the same. But then there are some cells that are all about variation. And your immune system is all about creating an infinity of variation, like 10 to the ninth different antibodies. Within a structured, unvariable system. Right. And so the unvariable system has to create that. And allow for it. Exactly. And so different parts of a company should have different cultures, like you said about finance versus something else. And it's incredibly hard to preserve a variety of cultures inside your company. And I'll tell you a really weird one is that HR has a tendency to imitate the part of the company that makes revenue. Sometimes HR shouldn't do that. And the reason is because HR wants to speak the language of the people who are making revenue and inherit the language of the people making revenue. But sometimes that culture is not the right one for getting payroll out accurately, for instance. I have two examples that I never get to talk about, probably because podcasts never get this deep. <laughs> so thank you for uh, opening the door to this, these two examples. Where do we see what you said happen every day? Where there's a system that's extremely structured with rules like any organism, okay, company, but you need variation in lots of different cultures and even creating more cultures consistently. So it's consistent, linear, yet nonlinear at the same time. It's called the United States of America. We have a very structured constitution with certain roles, with a judicial system that has it all pinned down. And any other country in the world looks at us with respect because it's so tight. However, you go to Seattle, you go to Miami, you go to New York, you go to LA, you go to Texas, you couldn't have more different cultures. And San Francisco, a bedrock of innovation. You go to the Midwest, you have farming, and they're the most innovative in farming. You go to New York, you have fashion, finance, and now finance is sprouting in Miami. It's this weird rules-based system that is as linear and as non-creative as you can imagine, which creates the most creative country in the world. Okay, that's one example I've always been fascinated with. And companies need to reflect what the US has done, where yes, you have this overarching rules, but in a way of being that's different than France, that's different than Turkey. And it's interesting because they all have human beings, but look how distinct the operating systems are and the way that these companies produce things and services and people and culture being one of those things they produce. The second example I'll give you is Procter & Gamble. I first saw this as a 22-year-old, and I was fascinated. I was so frustrated by the structure and the heaviness and all the approvals needed and everything we did. And, and they had thought of everything. This, at the time, it was like a 128-year-old company and forever working on 3% margins. And fascinated by, you know, these guys do it right. Like, they had the highest acceptance rate at Harvard Business School and at Wharton Business School. So I'm like, this is company. I should just, even though it's frustrating to me and I don't understand why they do all these things, I should trust it because... Everyone who's here is very successful. So I'm going to trust the process. It was so structured. But guess what they paid half of your bonus on and get your promotions on? It was getting business results. But the other half of all promotion and all uh, payment of bonuses was building the organization, basically being creative. How do you move the ball forward for this company that has nothing to do with your business unit? Is it are you training people that you weren't asked to do? Are you finding new ways that's going to help supply chain, help the whole company? Are you finding new products? 
they had somehow built in a system that would lead to creativity. Their advertising process, I thought advertising was creative ideas. For Procter & Gamble, advertising and marketing is a science, so much so that everything should be analyzed. Everything is a process. And it's in the process, the structured process, that you would create the most innovative creation. And so it was mind-boggling to me that they had created a process to structure creativity. That's fascinating. I'm very interested in the ratio of investment. Two terms, autopoiesis and allopoiesis. Autopoiesis is self-making, and allopoiesis, which I'm probably mispronouncing both of them, is making things outside of yourself. So what they've done there is they've split the two. Self-making is an important part of an organism's metabolism, is self-creation and self-maintenance. Let's allocate the equal parts there. I think that's a very powerful idea. And the idea that there's a structure to inventiveness that's not chaos. Correct. And incentivizing. You change behavior. I mean, look at the U.S. It's a country of individuals. And what's failing is the the second word you described, aloquacious, the external. How do I help my fellow man? Right? So you have 3,000 billionaires in the U.S. If you just took 3% of all the billionaires in the U.S. and did what Procter & Gamble did and told those people, you need to give back to the society that gave you all this, and they're incentivized, you would solve 80% of the problems in the U.S. And if you did that for the world, it'd be the same. So unfortunately, the world doesn't operate that way, and there isn't a Procter & Gamble governing body running the world. One of the most interesting experiments in culture, which is ongoing that I've watched (laughs) in the Bay Area, Genentech was bought by Roche, Swiss small molecule chemistry company, Genentech, large molecule, made of biologists. And one of the things that I think is related to your work around around making a culture of a company out of individuals is that I've noticed, because I was a recruiter for a decade, that recruiting a, a chip engineer is totally different from recruiting a mechanical engineer, is totally different from recruiting a marketing person. They're so different from each other, it's hard to explain <laughs> how different they are. And I was good at recruiting some of them. I couldn't recruit a marketing person to save my life. I could recruit a hardware engineer or a product manager or one of those other things. What happens is that the careers people choose might be filtering that population for personality types. And so now you've got these two companies, Roche and Genentech, who have been filtering both as countries and as professions, and now that one is going to own the other. What you're alluding to is actually at business school, Wharton Business School, they, I was shocked by the number, 70, 70% of M&A fails, not because on paper the business union doesn't make sense, because of the cultural class and they don't know how to work together. That is why companies fail when they merge, because it's a cultural challenge, because now you have 100 engineers from Roche, 100 engineers from Genetic, now they're forced to work together and they're talking different languages. They have a different culture of working and it doesn't produce the same thing. If it's like food, one food might taste great by itself, ketchup, and another thing like caviar might taste great by itself. You mix them, and it's not the same, and they're both ruined. It's a bad example. It's a good example. (laughs) And there's a moment for each. (laughs) Just like every company has a type of product they're creating, so there's a type of product manager for each. A couple examples, UKG, they just combined. Ultimate Software and Chrono Software combined to create UKG, third largest HRIS, Human Resource Information System company in the world. They have 100 million users in the combined company. I was talking to the chief product officer at the time who was dealing with the integration of one team of about 300 product managers with their counterpart. And this person was from Ultimate and they were integrating with the other product manager ahead of them, right? And Kronos Group is a payroll automation system. Ultimate software focused more on benefits and and, and other more nonlinear things like software automation. And so she described it once as, Kronos Group is a bunch of Swiss watchmakers who are perfectionists, and we are a bunch of Southern California surfers, and we're trying to make these two cultures work. And it has been one of the most challenging things for UKG. That's one example. Another example is even in the US, without M&A, the company Starbucks sees completely different cultures of a team of eight baristas in Miami Hialeah, where they're all Latin employees and Latin customers, which creates an experience in that Starbucks store where you come in, you're likely to spend seven to 12 minutes talking with the cashier register. They will come out from behind the register, grab your child, throw them in the air, squeeze their cheeks, touch you as a customer, 
and get very excited and talk about personal things and ask you, oh, are you still dating that guy? And I saw you come in yesterday and everyone in this line is now talking with each other. And it's a, it's the top performing store in Hialeah. You take those same eight baristas who are the highest performing and that culture that they've created in that Hialeah store and put them in Battery Park Starbucks in New York City. And you have them doing the same things with customers there. That same culture of high performance in Hialeah would be the quickest culture of failure in Battery Park. And they probably would get sued. They'd close the store and they'd be miserable. And that is the same job in the same store culture at a company in the same country and completely different cultures. Our tool, for instance, shows those different cultural re regional cultures. So when we go to retailers, we can show them the way and the people you hire in Texas in this town is very different than this town in Texas. So culture is even regional. And then the last example I'll give is when Coca-Cola hires a salesperson for Tennessee, that salesperson, they get a better offer to go work at Pepsi. Same role to be head of sales for Pepsi. Let's call it the B2B accounts, maybe. That top performing salesperson at Coca-Cola goes to Pepsi. Everyone thinks it's going to work out. Nine to 10 times, it doesn't work out. Not because they don't know how to do sales, but because the way you do sales, the way you work together, the sales is not an individual thing at large companies. It's working with teams of people. And the way that company has a culture of selling is different at Pepsi than Coca-Cola. And hence, you can't just pull people from one company to another to do the same job because you're discounting the most important factor, which is culture fit with the team and with the culture of the company and the culture of that function. Yeah, that coffee example is so funny. I used to travel a lot from California to North Carolina. And the first cup of coffee that I ordered in North Carolina, I was always like, what is wrong with you? Do you have brain damage? You're going like two miles an hour. <laughs> My first thought was, are, is there something wrong with you because you're making the coffee so slow? And then you go, oh, no, I'm no time is going differently right here. Time. And that that you even said that with the baristas, which is that time moves very differently in different places. So we're getting close to the end of the show. A couple of questions I always ask at the at the end. One of them is, what do you want hire your job to do for you? So it hires you to do something for it. What do you hire it to do for you? In life, I believe every human being, all 8 billion of us are extremely unique and we're put on earth for a specific purpose. And the hardest thing in life is to figure out what that purpose is. I truly believe that if purpose were a ship, human intelligence is my ship to fulfill my purpose. So I hired human intelligence to create the ship to fulfill my purpose. And what is that purpose? to make the world a better place, to make everyone happier, to democratize self-awareness, what I call consciousness. And when you do that and everyone understands themselves better, they will then also, through our tool, understand others better, which takes it from an individual way of self-awareness and consciousness to emotional intelligence, because emotional intelligence involves other people, not just yourself. And the biggest gap in learning and understanding that the world has today is understanding others Look at Israel Hamas situation. Look at the, the situation in Colombia with the rebels. Look at the poor performance of countries all over the world. And so, if I could deliver better human understanding to humanity through a tool that everyone can use, that would fulfill my purpose. And I hired human intelligence to be the tool to be able to do that. What does it cost you? It costs me having joy and gratitude every single day, feeling blessed and lucky to be alive every breath I take. So it's the best cost I've ever had in my life. Where can people learn about more about you and where can they learn more about human intelligence? About me, people can go to LinkedIn. My name's quite common, so you put my middle name in, Juan Luis Betancourt, and then I'll be the first name to pop up. Juan Luis actually is not a very common name, typically used in Cuba. You have Juan Jose and Jose Luis, but not Juan Luis. That's where they can learn about me and then about the company. They can go to humanintelligence.com. We've taken out the I-N and combined the word human and intelligence, so humanintelligence.com. People can email directly to me at juan at humanintelligence.com. And we have several podcasts and, and other uh, case studies and articles and thought leadership papers that we've written about all these topics there. Fantastic. I find your journey and what you're doing really inspirational in the sense that you have operationalized your purpose. You have built something designed around your purpose. Yes, I've never said that, but I'm gonna use that for, from now on. You just said it. I've operationalized my purpose of human connection. 
for everyone to be able to tap into it. Yeah, and got it to spread among companies. That's a really, a really aspirational thing to do. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for having me, Dart. This has been wonderful. Thanks for joining me for another episode of Work for Humans. If you enjoyed this episode, please give us a five-star rating wherever you listen to podcasts. And share the show with one person you think would get value from it. Believe it or not, this really helps us grow the show and reach more people who want to build the kind of work that people really want. As always, thank you to my producer, Jason Ames at Ninth Path Audio for his insights into content and his high standard for quality. Final note, the opinions shared here are my own and not the views of Google or Cisco Systems. Thanks again for listening. See you next time.